Um, but are you guys all set? Chris and Ningbo? Yeah, good to go. Awesome, good to go. All right. So welcome, welcome everybody. This is the first um, Ibipsa Boston meeting of 2021. And we're very excited because it's also, I think the largest one we've ever had. Um, so this is the first time we've been doing this uh, Zoom to YouTube streaming, uh, which is exciting. Um, what that means is um, basically you guys are seeing this on YouTube and it'll be recorded afterwards on the Ibipsa USA channel. So you can rewatch it later if you want. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. So um, we have Chris uh, Mackey and Mingo Peng giving our presentation on the next generation of honeybee uh, energy modeling. And uh, we're all really excited to hear their presentation. If you have questions throughout their presentation, please make sure to write those in the chat. Um, as we were testing this, we noticed Sometimes the chat has a little error when you first log into YouTube. So if you refresh your screen, maybe once or twice, uh, the chat should be working. So uh, make sure to write your questions then, and then we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end. Um, we'll be making kind of a selection of questions to share with uh, Mingbo and Chris. Um, as a reminder, we have a survey in the description. Uh, so please, uh, if you have time and you want to keep coming back to the Ibipsa Boston meetings, give us some feedback, tell us what topics you're interested in. There are links to follow us on our email list so you can stay uh, informed about future events, including um, our March meeting that will be coming up as well. And yeah, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Chris and Mingbo. So Chris Mackey uh, is a co-founder of Ladybug Tools, LLC and a lead developer of his software. He hails from a mixed background of architecture and building science, having applied ladybug tools to both professional architecture practice and the architecture and building technology degrees that he holds from MIT. He may be best known for his ladybug plus honeybee tutorial videos, which are consulted as a learning reference for thousands of professionals and students across the globe. Um, and Mingbo Peng is an application developer and researcher at Ladybug Tools LLC. He's a developer of Design Explorer, Colibri, and Iron Bug. Prior to Ladybug Tools, he was working as a senior project consultant at Thornton Thomas Eddy Sustainable Practice, Sustainability Practice, sorry, where he introduced an efficient parametric workflow for projects that need uh, full building energy modeling. Mingbo holds a master's degree in environmental building design from the University of Pennsylvania. And with that, I will pass it over to you guys. Okay, thank you, Mariana, for that uh, that nice introduction and for organizing this event. Uh, so, uh, can everyone can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so, as Mariana said, we are Chris Mackey and Mingbo Peng, uh, and uh, both of us are developers of Ladybug Tools, the open source project Ladybug Tools. Uh, and our mission with Ladybug Tools is to make environmental design knowledge and tools accessible to every person, project, and design process. Uh, and the way that we do that is through our open source core libraries and our open source Grasshopper plugin uh, that connects together various simulation engines uh, to the, the CAD uh, interface of, of Rhino Grasshopper. Uh, and we've developed out all of our core libraries and our Grasshopper plugin with a, a consistent set of values. Uh, and that's that the Grasshopper plugin is always completely open source uh, under an AGPL license. Uh, all of the engines that we connect to are validated and consensus built. Uh, uh, and also open source uh, in their way. And we're a community driven platform in that we let, uh, we let our community drive the new, the new features and things that we add into this core library. Uh, and lar largely because we've stuck to these values while developing out our software, uh, we're happy to say that our community today around Ladybug Tools is uh, much larger than we ever anticipated. Uh, the software, our Grasshopper plugin has been downloaded over 360 times. We have a forum with uh, over 4,000 community members with people posting almost every hour uh, and a forum that gets 5,000 pages per day on average, uh, which is consulted as a resource for people using the software and just for people generally learning about building science. Um, and so that kind of summarizes our Ladybug Tools community. Uh, but in addition to being an open source project, uh, we now have a, a company around Ladybug Tools uh, that we've, uh, and we do all of the, the services and products that we sell around this kind of free and open source uh, set of core libraries. 
We do this under the banner of pollination. Uh, and just, uh, just to give you a brief sense of what pollination really is at its core, um, is that pollination, it's a, it's a web platform that uh, it's, it's intended to help architects, engineers, researchers, and different uh, stakeholders in the building process collaborate uh, uh, and share inputs and outputs and uh, simulation logic for energy and environmental simulations. Uh, and this is all done to help make better form decisions and, and help collaboration within the design process. So the reason why I mentioned both of these sides is because most of the stuff I'm going to be showing you today is, is Ladybug Tools, is our free and open source uh, uh, Grasshopper plugin and core libraries. Uh, but there are a few capabilities uh, for pollination that have real research merit that we really were excited to, to show with you today uh, that come from pollination. Uh, and so the way that you'll be able to tell just at the outset whether we're talking about ladybug tools or pollination uh, is that we have these little icons that are at the top of each one of our slides. So whenever we're talking about our free open source project of ladybug tools, you'll see a little ladybug icon there. Uh, and if we are showing you something related to pollination related to our, our web platform capabilities uh, or the, the kind of services and products that we're selling around that, we'll, we'll put a little pollination over it. So for clarity's sake, uh, and with that out of the way, let's get into the meat of, of what we're excited to talk to you about today. So uh, in October, probably the most exciting thing we've had in the last few months, in October, we had a release of a brand new ground up revision of our most popular Grasshopper plugin. Uh, you can see we have a link to the full release notes here. If you guys are interested after this uh, presentation to dig into uh, all that we've added with this new uh, Ladybug Tools 1.0 release. Uh, but for the next 15 minutes or so, I just want to take you through a few of the, the highlights of, of features and enhancements that we've added with this ground up revision of the Grasshopper plugin, uh, which were not available in our legacy plugin. Uh, our legacy plugin being uh, what is still probably the, the one of the most widely used of our, of our Grasshopper plugins, but it is intended to be replaced by this new Ladybug Tools 1.0 release. Um, so, all right, without any further ado, let's run down the list of some of these uh, uh, new features that we have here. So, uh, off the start, uh, we have speed and performance enhancements uh, across the board, uh, and we're happy to say that probably several of the components, the Grasshopper components of our, of our Ladybug Tools plugin, uh, run in, in roughly half the time of their legacy counterparts. Uh, and I think we, we just wanted to clarify that this isn't because we necessarily uh, were clever, it found a new clever way to run a certain type of simulation, uh, but it's really just that we did that ground up revision that I mentioned, that we rewrote the code from the ground up uh, and we were able to do it uh, correctly this time. Uh, and if, I mean, if I'm being honest, probably our legacy plugin was a little bit like a, a five year long hackathon in the way that we put it together. And it was largely just about proving the concept. Now that we've rewritten everything from the ground up, everything is much more streamlined, much more coordinated uh, and much smoother to use. Um, and the reason why it matters, it doesn't matter simply just because uh, we all like speed and allows us to be more productive, but we can actually now build much larger models and uh, run studies over much larger design spaces than we could previously, just because the components can run in, in a much, much faster time frame. So it's not simply speed for speed's sake, but there's actually new capabilities that we really can model uh, because of this. So, all right, so that's a, a bit of a speed and performance enhancements. So now moving on to, to some of the other uh, uh, features that we have to show here. So uh, because we did a ground up revision, we now are uh, uh, dependent of, uh, independent of operating system. Uh, and so what this means is that we've now about 90% of the code that is used by the Grasshopper plugin lives in cross-platform core Python libraries. Uh, and the beautiful thing about these libraries is that they're pure Python. They can be run in Windows, Mac, or Linux. They can be run outside of Rhino Grasshopper. Uh, and this gives you a bit of a sense of what legacy looked like versus the new plugin. In legacy, the vast majority of our code lived in Grasshopper components. Uh, and so it really couldn't be run outside of Rhino Grasshopper or outside of Windows. Now that we've got 90% of this code uh, in these cross-platform libraries, uh, there's a lot of new exciting things that we can offer. Uh, and one of those is that our new plugin now works, our Ladybug Tools plugin works in Rhino for Mac. Uh, you can see here, this is a screenshot from my, my wife's laptop, uh, and I've run an energy simulation with uh, Energy Plus Open Studio, and I'm visualizing those results. Uh, so now we're happy to say that the, the brand new plugin uh, where is completely, fully compatible within, within Mac. Um, and uh, we know that's a, that's a big boon, especially for a lot of the, the, the students around the world who, who are uh, using Mac, Mac computers. So, 
that's one exciting thing. Another really exciting thing by virtue of the fact that we've now put all the code, 90% of the code in these cross-platform libraries is that we've organized this code into a, an SDK or a software development kit. Uh, so what this means, if, if anyone in the call is familiar with Rhino Common SDK or Open Studio SDK, it's a bit like that. Uh, but essentially we have these libraries uh, that they're documented and organized. They can be installed via the Python package manager pip. Uh, or they can be imported directly into with the GH Python component. You can just type import ladybug to get access to all of the things that we've worked on. And this generally just makes it much easier to build off of the work of ladybug tools, build your own components, build your own applications. Uh, and this is just a screenshot here of our documentation. We have full documentation for all of our core libraries that's searchable uh, and, and uh, organized so that you're, you're not in the dark. Um, and just to give you an example of what this kind of means for uh, uh, for people who especially want to build on top of Ladybug tools, uh, traditionally, the way that a lot of people built off the legacy plugin was by uh, clustering a bunch of our Ladybug tools components with native Grasshopper components into, into a cluster. Uh, but the thing is, those of you who tried to do this probably found that though it worked, it was hard to maintain because every time we'd update the plugin, you'd have to go through and manually update each one of these components inside of there. Uh, and the, the beautiful thing now is that now all of that, all those, those individual components can just be replaced with something like 20 lines of Python because the vast majority of the functionality lives within these reusable cross-platform core libraries. And the other beautiful thing is that this same code can be copy pasted from inside the component to, to be run outside of Grasshopper or to be run from another application. Um, and lastly, just one last thing to mention with regards to the SDK is that we had kind of always found with our legacy plugin that we'd wanted to make an educational pathway from uh, designing in, in CAD software to visual scripting with our plugins, uh, eventually hoping that people would get down into our Python source code, into editing the inputs of engines, and even editing some of those engine source codes, maybe even themselves. But it always seemed like there was a chasm in between our visual scripting plugins and our, and our Python environment. And the hope now is that we, now that we have an SDK, that this kind of eases that transition because the SDK is essentially an abstraction, a layer of abstraction above that, the source code. Uh, it'll just make it much easier for other people to, to uh, build their own uh, uh, applications and, and, uh, and custom stuff with our software. Okay, so that summarizes um, a lot of the, the benefits of having everything rewritten. Uh, to get a little bit more into the energy specific uh, features I wanted to show, so we have much better tools for QAQC and the LBT plugin. Uh, so Honeybee now is an entire tab that's just devoted to visualizing and checking model attributes. Uh, we have components for coloring uh, rooms with, uh, with attributes like constructions or like you see here, uh, coloring them with programs or with schedules or the various assumptions of the energy simulation. Uh, and also importantly, the geometry out of these visualization components is exactly the same as it is in Energy Plus or Radiance. Uh, and we're hoping that this ability to really easily check and validate models, uh, one, it just helps us make better models and better uh, and make sure that we don't make mistakes or, or draw the wrong conclusions from our models. Uh, and two, we hope that it allows people to really scale up and, and especially to make larger models uh, when they can very easily and quickly check all the assumptions across the model. Um, another new thing, getting even deeper down to the energy specific features. So we have a new object in the Ladybug Tools plugin called the construction set. Uh, and those of you who have worked with Open City are probably familiar with what this object is. But essentially, it's an object that contains logic about how to apply different constructions across different types of surfaces. So you can say all walls get this type of construction, all windows get this type of construction, et cetera. Um, and the beauty of this is that you can define that logic once in a construction set and then apply it to as many rooms as you want across a model. And you can even save that construction set now into a file, build up your own library of standards uh, regarding construction sets. Uh, and even then, then apply that construction set across different models and different buildings pretty easily. Uh, and this gives you a sense of what that construction set looks like. It's organized by walls, roof, floors, and the different boundary conditions of interior, exterior. Uh, but to really talk about why this matters, it's that now that we now that we have this construction set object, we can easily translate codes and standards into construction sets. So for example, Honeybee ships now with a, a set of construction sets that are compliant with ASHRAE 90.1 that includes those baseline uh, constructions. Uh, and they're organized, they're each organized by version of ASHRAE and by climate zone from hot to cold. So this makes it much easier to start your models from a, a climate sensitive point and, and a point that's not too far from what a real building would, uh, would be built with. 
Uh, and this is just shows you very quickly what it's like to use this new construction set library. So you select a climate zone from hot to cold. Uh, you select a building vintage uh, or, or a version of ASHRAE, and then you can select steel frame, wood frame, et cetera. And all the constructions that are needed to comply with that standard are, are essentially applied to my rooms or to my model. Uh, similar to construction sets, we also have a new object called program type. And again, those of you familiar with uh, Open Studio space types will recognize what this object is. But essentially, the program type houses all schedules and loads that define the usage of a space or a program in an energy model. Uh, and uh, you can have, just like a construction set, you can define that logic within that program once and then apply it to many rooms across a model. Uh, and you can even blend programs together to make mixed programs, which is particularly important as you uh, start to build larger buildings uh, and maybe you want to join two spaces together uh, or two uses of a space into, into one room. Um, and just like construction sets, you can save them into files and build up your own libraries of the most common building types that you create in your office or your research. Uh, so this gives you a sense of what the program type looks like that you have. Uh, uh, Sub, sub objects for people and lighting and electric equipment, infiltration, ventilation, et cetera. And all of the schedules and everything is contained underneath this object. Uh, and again, why this matters so much is that just like construction sets, Honeybee ships with a library of program types. Uh, in this case, the program types come from the DOE commercial reference buildings. Uh, so you have templates all ready to go for most of the major building types and room types uh, when, you, when you load up Honeybee. Uh, we also have those program types organized by version of ASHRAE, just like construction sets. Uh, and we also have many more building types than uh, templates for these building types than we offered in Legacy. We have laboratories and data centers, uh, lots of different uh, uh, sort of program templates available now. Uh, so you can see here, this is how it's used from within the Grasshopper interface. Uh, so in this case, I'm selecting out a, uh, uh, from the DOE commercial reference buildings, I can select mid-rise apartment or hospital. I select a version of ASHRAE that dictates things like the lighting power density uh, for that program. And then you can select an individual room programs out from those. Um, okay, so moving down the list of other new, new energy features we have, we have a lot more uh, HVAC templates available uh, that ship with Honeybee. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with our legacy plugin know that we have about maybe 15 or so uh, detailed HVAC templates in legacy. Uh, now there are over a hundred of them. Uh, and uh, most of the expansion of all these options comes from the fact that we have many different options in the plants, like air source heat pumps. Uh, but we also have just brand new templates like evaporative cooling uh, and a number of other systems. Uh, and the beauty of these HVAC templates is that the default efficiencies of all the equipment come from ASHRAE. Uh, so this makes it very likely that the using the template right out of the box is going to be close to what is what is really applied on a final building. Uh, and of course, all the ASHRAE Appendix G systems are supported. Uh, so this gives like a high level overview of the main like classes of templates that we have. Each one of these templates has maybe 10 or so variants, uh, but you can see that we have a lot of uh, a, a lot of some new systems and a lot more capabilities now within these uh, detailed HVAC templates. But I'll leave HVAC out there because Mingbo will get deeper into those. Uh, moving on down the list of features, we're happy to say the new plugin has full support for the Energy Plus Airflow Network. And I know especially people in the Abipsa community have been asking us for this for years. So we're really happy to say that we have this now. Um, and not only do we give full access to everything down to the little uh, individual crack uh, coefficients for the airflow network, uh, but we've also tried to make a one-to-one -one mapping between simple ventilation and the fully detailed AFN. Uh, so this hopefully makes it easy to start. Even the airflow network is itself a very complex uh, kind of beast of a, <laughs> of a simulation tool. Uh, you can set the, it up very quickly and you can even switch between uh, sort of a simpler representation of that if you need, for example, a simulation to run faster or you're not interested in capturing uh, interzone airflow uh, for a certain model. Okay, continuing down the list. So this one I want to take a, a few minutes to really uh, delve into a bit more, but we have much better streamlined workflows for making large models. Um, and a lot of this capability comes to the fact that we have a uh, completely reimagined uh, Dragonfly plugin that ships with the new LBT plugin. Uh, and while it still does export to the urban weather generator for urban heat island modeling as the legacy Dragonfly did, uh, it has really become a kind of means of quickly setting up uh, large scale energy and radiance models now, all the way up to the urban district scale. Uh, and the, the way, reason why it's such a good or uh, streamlined workflow for building these large models is that it's fundamentally a 2D representation of building geometry. So all rooms are assumed to be extruded floor plates. Uh, and this just generally streamlines the process of trying to build very large models. 
So this gives you a little bit of a sense of what the dragonfly schema is like, that this kind of smallest unit that you work with is a room that's just represented through a 2D surface. You can join those into stories uh, and then join those stories together into buildings. And just to give a few examples of how this streamlines the workflows of large models, so you can, you can certainly construct your buildings using this rooms of stories to buildings workflow to get very detailed in there. Uh, but also if you, let's say, wanted to just work from your closed solids your clo that you have uh, in early design as you're just uh, experimenting with massing, uh, it's much more streamlined to, to essentially turn that mass into a fully simulated, simulatable energy model with just a component uh, by slicing up that mass and then turning those, those slices into stories. Uh, we also have uh, very streamlined workflows for uh, from working from building footprints, which we know is important because so many of our geospatial data sets are footprint based like GeoJSON. Uh, so generally, a lot of these these methods of, of constructing large models from uh, from from those sets are much more streamlined. Uh, some examples of other parts of model setup that are much easier because of the this the dragonfly schema. Uh, you have much better intersection and solving of adjacency. Uh, it's very easy to, to specify duplicated stories where each story, dragonfly story, has a multiplier on it. So you just say this story is repeated 10 times over the height of the building. Uh, you can auto generate floor and ceiling plenums, or you can auto generate core perimeter zones. Uh, and you also have, because it's, the model is organized into stories, it's much easier to export each building or each story as a separate model for simulation. So this gives you just a sense of what it's like uh, to generate uh, ceiling plenums automatically or this is our straight skeleton method to uh, automatically do core perimeter offset in our from building footprints workflow. Uh, so again, a lot of things are just much more streamlined and easier because of this. Uh, and this is what allows us to make models at the scale that you see here. So I, I think a lot of you, at least the Boston audience, will recognize uh, these images. This is close to the Massachusetts Turnpike and the, the Hancock building. Uh, but you can see this model that was of uh, 300, over 300 stories. Uh, we can run it through Energy Plus, uh, set it up with Dragonfly, run it through Energy Plus, and color it with heating and cooling intensity. Uh, and I think, so this one that I ran locally took about uh, five hours uh, with, with eight CPUs running in parallel uh, to model each building on a separate CPU. Uh, so you can see that it's, it's, yeah, it's now possible to model on the scale that we couldn't before. Uh, and maybe to talk a little bit why it matters or the types of questions that we can tackle now that it's, it's much more streamlined to make these large models. Um, we know that the next generation of district systems is, relies a lot on uh, capitalizing on simultaneous heating and cooling. So taking the waste heat from one building and using it to heat another building, for example. Uh, and so we really need to model the district in order to understand like the overlap. Uh, so you can see here that same district, I'm looping through the months of the year to understand which months have the greatest potential for thermal overlap and when I can, uh, you know, where a district system, a new generation district system might be able to uh, capitalize on them. Um, and we can do experiments like, let's say if we, if we took that urban district and said it was 50% office and 50% residential, we could see the district-wide heating, cooling and overlap, uh, but then we can maybe let's try mixing in some restaurant or hospital and we see that that overlap goes up a lot and that potential to, uh, to really uh, capitalize on load sharing through a district system. Uh, becomes much greater. So we can look, work, look through scenarios like this. Uh, another really type of important scenario we can look at on this large scale is that we can do peak design day conditions, uh, which are important for uh, demand response plans. Uh, it's, I mean, oftentimes it's that peak that determines whether we have to build a, a dirty power plant that gets turned on for just that, that amount of time at the peak. So not having to build that is obviously a huge benefit. Uh, and there are all sorts of um, uh, good reasons, interesting questions that we can tackle by just looking at the, the design days like this. So, all right, so we covered how we can set up an urban scale model and sort of why some of the cool questions that we can tackle now that we have this capability. Uh, but let's go back to that question of how do we actually run the urban scale simulation? Uh, and so I mentioned before that this, this urban model took about uh, five hours to run in parallel, which is definitely a big improvement over, let's say, lumping the whole district into an Energy Plus model. Uh, that would be well over a day to do. Uh, but it's still, let's say I'm on a project and I want to try 10 different retrofit scenarios over the district. Uh, then the question is, how can I actually run those in a manner that doesn't take me, uh, let's say, a week to perform? Uh, and this is where I'm going to switch over to talking about pollination. Uh, leaving the ladybug tools part a little bit. So let's say I have a district here. I have that same district with the different programs assigned to it. I can write that district into a file that contains all the geometry and metadata for that district. 
I can upload that file to our pollination platform, uh, set up a run, a, a simulation run, uh, going from my project, selecting a recipe, which I'll describe a little bit more in detail in a second. But then I pick my EPW weather file, my, my model, and then I set the simulation to run. Uh, and this is what we call kind of seeing through the process. So you can see each step of the simulation being executed. Uh, and it's essentially in this case, each story of each building is being exported to a separate uh, model, Energy Plus model, and each one of those stories is run on a separate CPU. Uh, so that's what you saw scaling up there is that each story was then being run on, uh, in this case, 200 CPUs. Uh, and with 200 CPUs, we were able to run this district in about a half, a half hour to an hour. Uh, amount of time. So it's a significant improvement uh, over what you could do with a, with a desktop eight, eight, uh, eight core CPU uh, system. So uh, with the last few minutes that I have left here before I turn it over to Mingbo, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the, kind of, the kind of crux of what makes that scaling up of simulations possible, uh, which is what we call a recipe. Uh, so you see the geometry and metadata that was all contained in that urban district file that I saved to my computer. Um, but the kind of thing that makes us all work together is that we have the logic of a simulation encoded in this recipe. Uh, and that's what allows us to produce results. And very importantly, you can see that we tried to expose uh, exactly the steps that are happening in that recipe. So you can really understand what's going on and how it's progressing uh, and what the assumptions of the simulation are uh, under the hood. And we wanna differentiate this from a lot of other tools that we know where you may simply take geometry in, get results out. And there were a bunch of assumptions made for you uh, you know, we kind of call this a magic box <laughs> where we're not totally sure at the end exactly what we got out of the simulation or maybe how to interpret the results. Uh, but, uh, or maybe to say another kind of example of this situation that falls short of what we're really trying to, to do uh, is that you have the geometry and metadata. So you know some of those input assumptions, but you have a black box where you don't really know what's going on inside of the, the, uh, the simulation. And while maybe you can understand and interpret the results a bit better, uh, there are still some open questions. So. The kind of what we've really tried to do here with our, our pollination platform is really expose that recipe logic so you can really see what's going on. Uh, and that's also, we've, we've tried to, we've made the recipes in a manner that they, the scalability is built into them. So essentially you can take this recipe uh, that, you've, that uh, you've created this workflow logic, you can run it locally on a desktop. Uh, so this is, this is, you see here, the execution logic for a desktop run. And you can take that same recipe and run it with our pollination cloud computing resources, uh, which you just saw in the, in the video I, I showed previously. So this gives you a bit of a sense of, uh, of essentially how recipes work and how they're kind of the crux of our, uh, of our, our pollination platform. Uh, another really important aspect of, of recipes, not just being able to run them in, locally and scale them on the cloud, uh, is that we really wanna make a community around these recipes, much like uh, the community that we have around uh, Ladybug tools. So we are contributing recipes as part of Ladybug tools, a lot of the very standard types of recipes like annual daylight and daylight factor, annual energy use, uh, some comfort mapping workflows, we are contributing as Ladybug tools. Uh, but we're really hoping to have community contributions of, of these, uh, these workflows as well throughout Pollination Cloud. Um, and lastly, of course, because we're a business at the end of the day, there'll be enterprise uh, uh, recipes that contain the specific logic or, or simulation logic that, uh, that particular companies want to use, or those uh, particular companies can share that logic with their clients or, or, and, and get control over that. And that's essentially how uh, how pollination works. So with that, now that I've kind of taken you to a very broad scale of how we can scale up to run a whole district, uh, Mingbo is going to uh, take it over from here and going to delve deeper into the kind of uh, the details and assumptions underneath the model and show you how you can really customize those uh, with, with, uh, with Ironbug and, and, uh, and Ladybug tools. So uh, with that, Mingbo, I'm going to, uh, are you ready to go? I'll, I'll pass let it over me, to you. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Can everyone see my screen, right? Yes, you are yep. good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Chris, uh, it seems okay. So Chris has has basically introduced the Ladybug, new Ladybug tools, and then also the pollination cloud. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring everyone from the cloud to the local machine again. So we are also developing developing the new plugins for the Rhino for the Revit, and and all those the UI are we are built on. Uh, it's a cross platform. Basically, you can you have you get the same dialogue, no matter you are working from the grasshopper, grasshopper or Rhino or Revit or Windows or Mac. So basically, when if if you learn if you learn the 
uh, this this program once, and then you you can uh, work uh, on any platforms. And because this is in Rhino, we can build it's very build a large model very easily. So here I'm just visualizing the uh, boundary conditions for Unreal Unreal building. This is like like roughly 200 zones model. And then now I'm just checking the boundary condition for internal internal zones. So here I have I found one problem is it there's uh, some adjacency adjacency is not correct, and this uh, these two uh, looms is elevated on different elevations. So now I have to we can just easily switch uh, these surfaces to a ground ground type boundary condition. And uh, in in this Rhino in Rhino environment you can do basically everything. Or you can you you can expect inside the right uh in like modeling platform basically like scaling it just scales the uh, room uh the the windows uh directly and then you can just select the uh, each uh each window and delete and then you can even do the undo to control the undo undo the last step so which is really not impossible in a lot of platforms because if you want to do more you can keep working on keep working uh, everything in the Rhino and finish the simulation in Rhino. But you, you also have access, you can access the entire model directly to the Grasshopper. You can start to build a parametric model on top of the Rhino model. And everything will still work is the same. In this case, I'm just adding, uh, uh, selecting all those zones facing south and uh, add the shadings to all those windows. They, all, all of this can happen because we have built a, a brand new open source uh, a file format called HBJSON in collaboration with the Unreal. And the big, because of this new format, we can uh, very easy to, uh, to host this model into, into the web interface. So if you are a manager, a project, a team manager, you don't have to install any plugins on your laptop. You can just go to the, our web interface, go QVQC the model. It's, it's gonna be very easy. So all of things are good. Like what a lot of users are using our tools to build like a, a conceptual phase or SD SD phase project. What about those projects in, in DD or CD phase? So in in particular, those uh, uh, building a, a a detailed HVAC system based on MEP schedules, are pretty it's pretty difficult. So how can we model uh, like this kind of workflow very efficient and uh, flexible? Now let's look at the like three different blocks in our current workflow. So basically, lot of so basically we uh, we have to deal with build a geometry in one platform and then keep adding the system to uh, in, in another platform and then probably probably everyone has their own spreadsheet uh, Excel sheet uh, to to like uh, QQC and uh, output uh, formatting the results. And in this presentation, we are just on, uh, gonna focus on the first two parts. So a lot of people like using the SketchUp or, or, or Rhino with a Honeybee to model the geometry. And then later on, they export the OSM file to the OpenStudio app. Because these two kind of like world is totally isolated, most, mostly isolated. And then you can only access uh, the OpenStudio app via the, uh, it's, uh, it's supported a file format. If you want to do a li do a little bit more, be more flexible. Basically, you have to rely on relies on the measure. So a lot of time, when whenever you are trying to something new, you can you you will try to Google Google how how can we do this this in Open Studio, and then you you often will be answered like on the, from the form like you, you can this X is not available in the Open Studio app. But you can do, you can find a uh, measure, write a measure, or use SDK, or even edit a, a OSM file. So open, so me, so measure, measure is really a great concept for uh, developers. So basically, if you know how to do coding, you if you have done uh, some program previously, it's gonna be pretty pretty useful. But for regular user, basically, it's not really feasible. So. I guess we, I think we, we, we really want to uh, like integrate the, integrate the platform, but it's not like a isolated ABCD software. What I mean by that is we need an integrated platform with a robust like modeling, uh, geometry modeling capability. Basically, I, I, because a lot of people are complaining like we while using other software like modeling 
geometries in software A is really painful because they, they are just reinventing the wheels. Well, they, they are not like good at modeling geometries in their proper platform. And we need an integrated platform with a standard like function, uh, functionalities with like undo, redo, because there's other, some other platforms that they're rebuilding everything from scratch. And because like because that that's it's like the basic 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 software functionality is not available like undo like I often when I was working as a consultant in an engineering firm I often like pulling my hairs like when I did uh delete some some settings by mistake uh when I, uh, after I set after I spent like hours to set it up now as then because there's no control Z because that means like you have to redo everything again. And we need an integrated platform with a full transparency because basically it's quite common in a lot of platforms, like like especially for like a startup for beginner. Like I, I just pick the option and run the same run the result. Like I if if uh, an engineer or the designer asks them like how is that gonna be how it's modeled, like we don't know. Like we we don't we don't have options to really look at into the details. So, so now let's go look at like this to kind of like work on the workflow because this one is told right now is isolated. What if we merge these two uh, different workflows into one pla one platform? Because we know the Open Studio Open Studio app like doesn't it's it's isolated application. It doesn't really works with the uh, inside of the Rhino or, or SketchUp. So, but Open Studio SDK works inside of all those platforms. So that's that's where Ironbug com comes in. So what Ironbug is is basically a tool set for, for users to freely modeling the real world com complex and the customized customizable HVAC systems. So now we can just look at the two different platforms. So one is uh, on the on, on your on your left is obviously the app. On your right is uh, Ironbug a script. So basically here I'm so it looks pretty different, but I'm gonna just uh, using uh, just let's let's just look at the uh, 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 supply side of the air loop, just look into to compare the two of them. So basically, on the left you have like five five components from the auto air system, including coil, heating coil, fan, and the sample manager goes horizontally. Now in the in the uh, iron bag, basically you it's basically exactly the same thing. It goes vertically, but the on the left is basically a, a HVAC, HVAC loop base uh, you have to model in every project again and again and on the left on the on the right is a, a reuse reusable template built inside the grasshopper that means you can basically do control c control v if you have if you have built the same system in previous phase now projects come back in, in, in DD or CD, you can just keep using the same settings from the pre build from last one and then just rebuild, re just rebuild the geometry and apply the same system to the, pre to the uh, new geometries. And even you can, you can do control Z now. I, I don't, I'm not, I don't have to worry about my, I, I'm going to lose all my hair. <laughs> so let's look at, let's look at some like real examples. In Open Studio app, you only have the one option to build like uh, SFP uh, airbox uh, with 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 the electric electrically heat coil. Because in in practice, it's quite common. It's quite common. You have to you you uh, you will need to build uh, the the same uh, same airbox with a hot water heat coil. But how can we do that? So it's it's just a coil inside the airbox. Right, so you just replace with electric heating coil with a hot water heating coil. That's it. It's as simple as that. In you can just very do the very customized, customizable uh, workflows inside the Grasshopper. And we also build. We have to embed it all entire uh, any plus documentation inside the the plugin. So basically, you don't have to go back and forth to go to check the the uh, any plus input and output uh, reference or engineers engineering reference from the other places and uh, if you have if like if for this uh, in this example if you want to build a, like a uh, central central heat pump you have basically have a full control to make a central heat pump for example like you have a uh, like full access to the uh, chiller heaters and the chiller heater modules and the pump system heat pump system 
in Open Studio, basically, it, 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 it groups everything together, and then you basically you don't have like that level of this access controls. One of the most difficult thing to model uh, in HVAC system is basically a uh, uh, VIF system, because in VIF system you basically have to model like more than twenty performance curves. And if you are using the default, if you use a default uh, VIF system from Open Studio, that's that's very inaccurate because there's no performance curve inside. Basically, if you want to uh, model an accurate system, you have to ask the manufacturer or your MEP to give you to provide all those performance curves. So here you have full controls and full access to those input parameters. If if you are if you are uh, a pro user, you you want to change all those uh, values. And of course, if you are a, a starter, a beginner, you don't have to build everything from, from scratch. You can just pick one template from previous LSM file or some, you can ask an engineer to, to set up that, that performance curve for you. You can just import that, that file and then in your new new script, you just use the, those reference objects to build your new system. And, uh, and if, Something sometimes like someone still doesn't like uh, uh, modeling geometry things like right now, you can still keep working uh, modeling the geometry in like SketchUp or Revit. So this is one of the projects I built like two years ago, completed inside the Revit. Now I can just uh, export to the OSM file as a geometry file and then import it here to keep work adding the system to them to that uh, project. And uh, it's quite often like in a lot of meetings, like someone, someone will will ask, like, what if we do this? What, what if we do that? So in this case, we have a one building with two completely different systems. So one is uh, so error A is error A is like with uh, is using the uh, active tool beam with the West, and the error B is using a regular VAB system, uh, reheat system. And uh, in one meeting, like one of one of the uh, team member asked, like, what if what if we change the system, like? Like just imagine, imagine if you are using your current workflow, how long it would it take you to, to, to rebuild that system? Basically, you have to rebuild every air terminal and the setting up uh, all those like uh, 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 reheat uh, uh, box and the active tube beam. And in this case, basically, it takes like a couple seconds. And uh, here's, here are some, some highlights, and I guess we are kind of like learning out of time. I, I'm going to skip those things. Uh, so now, now we are able to minimize, minimize the modeling and the simulation, simulation uh, uh, time, to minimize the sim modeling and simulation time, like so, so that not, so instead of, instead of spend a lot of time to model, uh, model and uh, to mod, uh, uh, Modeling and the sim running simulation to answer the, what is the UI. Now we can spend a lot, spend more time rerunning the simulation, uh, running more iterations basically, and then have more conversations with with the team member to ask like why, 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 what if, and why not. So that's it. So happy modeling and then stay product productive. So we are ready to answer any questions. Uh, maybe before we do that though, we just want to say that we, we are hiring now. We're looking for a, a front end developer. Uh, so if, if anyone on this call is interested in that, you can apply for that uh, at our website. Uh, and maybe also before we also open to questions, uh, it's worth uh, to give a, a shout out and a thank you. If you could tell already from this presentation that both uh, both Mingbo I and all of us across Ladybug Tools have made really heavy use of Open Studio. Uh, we owe a lot of thanks to the Open Studio development team, uh, and we also owe a lot of thanks to the Department of Energy. Since a lot of the capabilities that you, you we've showed you here uh, were only possible uh, because we we received a, an SBIR grant from the Department of Energy. So, I think with that, now let's uh, let's open up to questions. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you both so much. That was. Amazing. <laughs> um, we have a lot of questions in the chat. Yeah, I think most of it is enthusiasm and excitement to see what's coming up next. So thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, a few questions that were repeated, I can bring them up is, 
with the construction sets be updated in the future with every new iteration of ASHRAE 90.1, IECC, or for European versions? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, yeah. So I, I should say also, I mean, I, I know I just gave a shout out to Open Studio, but the, actually all of that data for the standards was collected by the Open Studio team and it exists in the, the Open Studio standards gem. Uh, so I know they've had it on their agenda to add ASHRAE uh, 2016 and like and to keep it updated into the future. And there's, so we're definitely going to have future versions of ASHRAE uh, as as soon as as uh, NREL and Open Studio team adds that in, we'll we'll update that and expose it on the Ladybug tools end. Uh, and I know they're also adding standards for for Deer and and uh, and other. They're hoping to get international contributions too. So uh, if those happen, we will we'll expose them. Excellent. Um, also, can we use pollination to make a passive house design? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most definitely. I mean, the, everything is is uh, customizable to you know whether it's creating your own constructions or uh, creating the uh, a kind of highly efficient HVAC that you'd use in a passive house. Um, or, I mean, especially probably a lot of the HVAC maybe at that level you might want to do with with Iron Bug because it uh, it allows you, as you saw, to do uh, such customization. But yeah, there's not definitely nothing stopping you. I mean, there are over, what is it? Probably over 400 components between the new Ladybug Tools plugin. Ironbug, Mingbo has how many? Like Roughly uh, 200, yeah. 200. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, you can customize, uh, you know, and, and how many combinations are there between 600 components? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I guess the pollination is basically a platform to help you to run your simulations. Basically, it, it's, it doesn't matter if what what you are learning, right? So basically, and the, we have we have built a recipe basically uh, to convert the uh, proposed case uh, model to a uh, lead base, baseline. So it's a one a recipe basically you can just run everything on on the pollination and then it automatically converts to lead baseline model and then gives you a report basically. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I realize now, uh, uh, ADT, you know, I guess the question is more, can you, is there an automated workflow to add the passive house standard or take a model and, and convert it over to that? Uh, I mean, yeah, well, we, you can see, as Mingbo said, we already have stuff to make the baseline model from, a, from any, any design model. So I think in the future, there's nothing stopping us from adding recipes for that specifically. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I think you already touched on this, but just want to uh, flag this also. Is there a list of all the HVAC system templates and kind of what the inputs are and all of that? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, yeah, Mingwa, yeah. go first. Yeah. So for, for HVAC system templates, like basically we have to build exactly the same thing. So for right now I have built like, like roughly 15, exactly the same, like same, same list as a legacy version. So you basically you can compare the Apple to Apple, the two system and then in Ironbug version, you can just double click and go inside each details and then you just change it. If it's it's a template doesn't work, right? And then for the templates from the Open Studio side, this those are I guess Chris can answer that. Yeah, yeah. So so for the ones that I, I showed that were ready to run kind of out of the box, not not uh, not customizable all the way down to the level of Ironbug, those hundred templates, uh, yeah, the components for those are actually just a drop down list. So you can see specifically and you know they they say exactly what equipment is different about each one. So, uh, so yeah, so that's that's the list. And and again, like all those assumptions for those out of the box templates come from the standard shim, the Open Studio standard shim. So that's that's the reference I point to. Uh, if someone really cool wants to get deep into it. Awesome. Um, there was another one about time savings. You mentioned a lot of this is much faster than the other tools that are available. If can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Well, I think I, I guess we should say our benchmark was our, our legacy plugin, which which may not necessarily be the most. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as I said, we kind of uh, uh, when we put it together at first, it was really just trying to prove the concept, and we weren't as concerned about the speed. So, I, I mean, it depends from component to component, but essentially every component is faster in in LBT uh, compared to its legacy counterpart. Uh, I, don't, I mean, there's none that are really slower. Um, and, uh, and I mean, the, the amount by which they're faster kind of depends on which one it is, but um, yeah, but it's, it's generally, I mean, the components to make an energy model, like took, let's say, I think I showed an example of 11 seconds to take their geometry and add all the properties for an energy model. And that now runs in like a second and a half. So uh, yeah, so it's a significant difference in some cases. Awesome. Um, we have like the questions are just popping in now. I'm just gonna keep going through them and we can stop whenever you're tired of answering them. 
Let's go. Um, when might the CAD plugins be available? Uh, Is there a timeline that we can share? Yeah, yeah. So, so the the particularly, I guess you're asking about the Rhino plugin that Mingbo showed. Is that right? I, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, and and the well, we didn't show the Revit plugin, but we have a Revit plugin that uses the same UI that uh, that Mingbo showed. So, we're starting just starting to roll out early access for those. Once we're past early access, which we hope is just you know uh, in a matter of, of months or a month or two, then we can start to open it up. Uh, and uh, and I, I mean, I should we should clarify that the Rhino plugin and the Revit plugin are part of the pollination. Uh, we may not have pointed out that, that we put the pollination logos on that one. So so we're selling the those particular interfaces that work directly from Rhino and Revit. Those are those are packaged with pollination uh, when mm -hmm. you buy a pollination subscription um, or you can buy them standalone. The Grasshopper plugin, as I mentioned, is always free and open source. But those those interfaces uh, uh, for Rhino and Revit will be will be selling. Yeah, within the next few months. Was it? Oops, sorry. Aditi, can you, I think you're. Uh, you're She's back. She's back. She's back. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. I think my internet connection is unstable. I wasn't sure if it was mine or yours. I was like, hmm. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going ahead on that list. Um, someone said there, are, there seem to be some components missing in Ladybug 1.0 as compared to legacy. Do you know when they will be added? Yes, yeah. So that that's a very good point. So if you if you read our release notes, we have there are still some legacy features that we're working on porting over to the new LBT plugin. Uh, I want to say at this point, probably about 80% of the legacy features we have in the in the new plugin. Most of the stuff that's missing at this point is actually somewhat ironically is the are the a few ladybug visualization components. Uh, so people notice them at first, uh, and I know we've got a lot of questions about them. But we will definitely we'll be adding support for them over the next uh, few months uh, with, with stable releases. I, we're about to do I think another stable release of the Grasshopper plugin uh, very soon, and that's already going to have. Um, a few critical things that are missing, like psychometric charts and, uh, and other features. So, yeah, we're definitely like our, the plan is to get. I mean, there are a few exceptions of things that we can't run on Mac that we aren't necessarily prioritizing uh, bringing over. But by and large, almost everything you can do with Legacy, we're hoping to uh, bring it all into the the new plugin, the LBT plugin, over the next few months. Awesome. Uh -huh. I think Mustafa is doing a great job of answering a lot of the questions. So that's <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> he's, he's really going through a lot of the list. Um, there's another one someone mentioned is how limited are the tools relative to energy plus limitations and can it handle a double energy recovery wheel AHU? Super specific. Yeah. Yes, for, for double double uh, heat recovery wheel. So basically, as as long as you just add another another heat recovery in in, in your auto system, basically. It, it will work. Just just add another one. It's just as simple as that, right? <laughs> you make it so sound very simple. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you don't have to worry about like how to how to make the connection, all those stuff, and then just add a new one. And just add another one. There, it will just work. Yeah, yeah. And there's, I mean, maybe it's worth highlighting that we've really tried to make it. You know, like I guess we say that it's never that you can't do anything. It's just a matter of just uh, just how to do it, right? Like. I mean, there, there's already like the six, 600 components that I mentioned, but, uh, but yeah, you can always like, we also have support if you want to add in measures or add in additional energy plus strings, like we don't stop you from really customizing it down to exactly what the engine offers. Um, and so, yeah, and, and iron bug as, as Mingbo mentioned is, yeah, almost any HVAC, any HVAC you could build with the OpenCV SDK pretty much, right? Uh, you can do with iron bugs. Yeah, I, th I think that's all the questions we have so far. They keep coming in and Mustafa keeps like <laughs> answering them super quick. <laughs> so shout out to him for taking that. I guess but... you guys have to need to hire Mustafa as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, oh, we had another one coming. Oh, where do the 100 plus HVAC templates come from? Meaning how were they selected? Who was the development team? And kind of a little bit about that story. Yeah, so I guess I could say, well, I mentioned earlier, so we're taking all those from the uh, OpenStudio standards gem, 
Uh, and the Open Studio Standards gem itself is taking a lot of the those default assumptions of the individual pieces of HVAC equipment from uh, well from ASHRAE ninety point one. Um, so that that's probably like the the, the reference to to go for them. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I know probably yeah. There's documentation for the standards gem too, which which is is uh, is is uh, worth worth looking at. But yeah, but that's I think that's probably the resource between the standards gem and uh, like the ASHRAE ninety point one text. Uh, that probably that that gives you covers a lot of of what those templates come or what they are and where they come from. We have another one that's super specific about one type, but I can, is it possible to model free cooling heat exchanger for water cool chiller and also a model steam and also model a steam boiler in Ironberg? Uh, could you say it again? I was sure. I was reading the comments. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not at all. There's so two things the person's asking is can we model one a free cooling heat exchanger for a water cool chiller? Yeah, I guess I guess in Open Studio, Open Studio, if if the Open Studio supports that, or or, or even Energy Plus, if you can model the same thing in Energy Plus, basically you can model everything in Iron Buck, basically. Yeah. So it's built yeah. on top of the SDK. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that answers the second part also. It's also specific about one system. So if it's available yeah. in Open Plus, it should. Be. Yeah. Yeah, basically, if 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 it works in Open Energy Plus system, basically you can you can do that. Uh, yeah, I think we are all caught on. Surprisingly, we still have a few more minutes to go. So if if you wanted to share anything else, uh, maybe actually we can just say because if uh, I mean if if people may not have asked it, but I feel like they were thinking about it. If they uh, uh, can, everyone see my screen quickly here. Yep. You are um, sharing. Yes. Yeah, we can just say that if you wanted to uh, uh, download Ironbug and work with it, the place that we'd point you to is, is Mingbo's release on our forum. Uh, at discourse.ladybugtools and specifically the, the iron bug preview release. This has installation instructions for how to install it uh, and get all set up on it. Um, if you guys, I mean, if, if people are interested in the latest ladybug tools, I, I guess we're, we're now on what version 1.1. I know I said 1.0 at the top, uh, but you can get that just from Food for Rhino where, you, where we've uh, traditionally put our legacy plugins. It's right next to those. Uh, and that downloads with a set of installation instructions uh, in the text file. Um, and the installation is still such that we make you go through the engine. So if you're, if you're using the free installer on Food for Rhino uh, that you download here, uh, you have to install each of the engines individually. And uh, we have a, like a compatibility matrix. So you have to make sure that you pick the right version. Um, you could probably go through the whole process in like uh, maybe 20 to 30 minutes uh, for an individual machine. So uh, we think one, that's usually a good learning experience for people who uh, want to learn about what's under the hood of the software. Uh, but if let's say you're trying to install Ladybug tools on 100 machines across the university, uh, we just want to we'll say quickly that we sell single click installers. Um, they can be run from command line. So if you are tasked with the, the job of trying to install this on a bunch of different computers, uh, we'd really recommend that you, uh, you contact us about, uh, for this because it will, yeah, it'll save a bunch of time and, and a bunch of headache uh, because you know that you'll be getting a correct installation. So uh, this is the email to contact us at if, you, uh, if you're interested in that. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I guess that's, that's uh, all that we had to show. Is there, are, are there any other questions? Um, just another one is, will we have new tutorials? I think everyone's waiting to listen to you again. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, that's a good question. <laughs> so yes, most certainly, uh, most certainly. I mean, uh, I, I, I've been in a little, I, all of us, I think I've been in a little bit of a code cave uh, the last like year or two, uh, putting together this release. So, uh, you know, now that we're starting to get to the point where we're really rolling things out uh, and, and uh, we don't have our, our nose uh, into the grindstone and our, our heads in the, in the code gate. We want to start rolling out more educational content. Uh, and especially, yeah, and we, we've actually got someone now, we just uh, uh, hired someone to really help us with uh, produce educational content and organize it so that it's, it's very useful for uh, teachers and, uh, and students. So, yeah, that'll be coming. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I think everybody recognizes your voice from that, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I think that's that's a good place to stop if we haven't had any new questions and I'm sure everyone will be eager to get in touch with all the links that you shared. Mm -hmm. um, any last thoughts? Uh, well, thank you everybody for listening. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks for uh, so hosting thank us. And Absolutely. I think 90% of the chat has been like, this is amazing. Thank you so much for your work. Excellent. We really look forward to using it. So definitely, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And for everyone who's listening, please uh, share your thoughts on what other topics you'd like us to cover. And we have monthly meetings. So please sign up for our uh, mailing list, your followers on LinkedIn and Twitter. All of the information is in the description. And Thanks again for tuning in. The recording will be available on the YouTube channel. So if anybody's missed anything, definitely go back and take a look. But yeah, on the dot. Thank you so much, Chris and Ringo. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you both so much.